So, um, real radical changes came with the Soviet attack on Central Asian culture and society. At the United Nations in Kabul, as soon as I said Soviet attack on Central Asia, I heard from behind me, it's me, brother. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. I had a heckler, and she heckled me by going tisk, 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 making tisk noises throughout my presentation. Uh, and I don't, I, she was apparently from Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan and working for the United Nations, and she didn't, she didn't like my criticism of the Soviet Union. Um, but my point was that whether this was an attack or reforms or whatever you want to call it, it created enormous changes in Central Asian society. Maybe not ones that were intended, but the resulting changes, the result was marking Northern Afghanistan and Central Asia as different cultural, political, and economic zones, uh, despite the shared languages and religious traditions. So, yeah, sure, the, the, the Stalin um, statues are long gone. Plenty of these left in Tajikistan. And a um, little anecdote, this is in uh, Kulab, Kulab, in southern Tajikistan, uh, not too far from the Afghan border. Um, actually, right in this park, a little further back, yeah. Do you consider Soviet influence attack, however you want to call yeah. it, to begin with the Stalinist era? Um, uh, early, mid-1930s okay. onward, and then until they sort of gave up on rural Central Asia and how they define that in the 60s or 70s or early 80s. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, a little behind this is a, a bunch of old men uh, playing chess, and my friend is like, yeah, those are the old communists. It's like a communist chess club. And uh, they, they, they sit and they hang out there. Um, it's a really interesting place. You head outside of town, and there are airplanes arriving. I mean, huge airplanes. So it's like international airport. And it is guest workers coming back from Russia. From it's several flights a day. Um, huge planes flying in. These little villages near Kulab are very strongly connected uh, to Russia. Um, and here, talking with people in the village, hanging out with families, it's as if Afghanistan doesn't exist at all. It's just never a subject of conversation. Imagine almost like their back is to Afghanistan, and they're looking to Dushanbe and to Russia. And for them, Afghanistan is not something that really comes up in their daily life. They're not particularly, there's no fear of Afghanistan. There's no idea of opportunities or it's just there. Um, there's the border and they don't cross it. Um, sitting in people's houses in here, uh, it's, the television is all Ukraine and Syria. Um, mm -hmm. That's everything. That's, people want to talk about like, oh, you're American. Like, what do you, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about Ukraine? Um, but never like, well, the American military is doing active operations right across the border, and that's just not something they, they, they thought to bring up. Um, very, very few have contacts with Afghanistan. It's pretty rare that I find someone that will occasionally say, yeah, I go down to Kunduz once in a while, I have a business partner down there, and it's pretty small scale. Um, and there, are, there is some cross-border uh, shuttle trade. There's some Afghan businessmen in Tajikistan, but again, it's uh, compared to the connections with Russia, it's 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 tiny. Um, so I gotta rewind a bit in history. Um, the Soviet Afghan War. Um, the divisions between the Soviet Union and Afghanistan, and between Central Asia and Afghanistan, actually strengthened strengthened as a result of the Soviet Afghan War. At this time, uh, security requirements turned to border zones and cross-border interactions. Um, they were very securitized and militarized uh, after this point. Um, there, there. Um, so we get towards the end of the war. Um, you'd think after the war, then maybe that's the opportunity then for independent countries of Central Asia to interact with Afghanistan, but not possible. Civil war in Afghanistan breaks out. Inside Afghanistan, they've got problems. Central Asia has its problems, and there is no big idea at this time in the early 1990s, and throughout the 1990s, that it's time to integrate the region and uh, build trade networks. It's, uh, isolation really remains. Um, that's Kabul. Right now, this area now, obviously about 200 cars. 
Um, so, um, the new governments of Central Asia, they really preferred to isolate themselves. Uh, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan were successful in this regards in isolating themselves from Afghanistan. Uh, heavy militarized, secure borders. Uh, however, Tajikistan would really have no choice in this matter. Uh, Tajikistan breaks out in civil war in 1992, nothing to do with Afghanistan at the beginning, it was completely internal. Uh, however, about 90,000 refugees and opposition fighters fled into northern Afghanistan, and this is uh, one of the refugee camps in the north. I couldn't get the location, I think it's Kaha, um, possibly. Um, after the peace agreement in 1997 in Tajikistan, uh, Tajikistan began its role as a base of operations for sending uh, Russian weapons and other forms of support to anti-Taliban forces in Afghanistan. As the president of Tajikistan, as Ahmed Shamasud, the, the top commander in um, the north. Um, the relationship at this time, however, was mostly about security. No broader social or economic interactions really occurred during this time. Um, we move forward. Uh, just four years later, um, after 2001, uh, a whole new set of relationships begin. Um, mostly military on the west part. I'll move through them. Um, so, Central Asian governments uh, supported American and NATO operations in Afghanistan. Um, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan somewhat publicly, enthusiastically, Turkmenistan secretly. Um, we'll look at that. Um, so important here, uh, Uzbekistan especially until 2005, um, hugely important base. Given the scale of American operations, they needed a base in the region at the time. That was the main base. Um, of course, uh, Manas in uh, Kyrgyzstan was hugely important as transit. That has now moved to Romania. Uh, a little more expensive, but uh, no big deal. They can still get what they need to and from Afghanistan. Um, for the Germans, uh, Termes in southern Uzbekistan, they recently apparently signed a new deal to continue um, uh, an air base in Uzbekistan. Um, Germans are going to continue in Afghanistan with like, training missions, um, support for Afghan security forces and government. They, they feel they need a little bit longer in Uzbekistan. Um, Dushanbe. Uh, the French uh, have fully, fully left. Um, they've been doing a slow withdrawal over the last year. Um, this is a uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, he has fresh seafood in front of him. It's actually uh, in Dushanbe if you want fresh seafood. Apparently, this is the only place you could get it. Um, and Marlene, I'm not making I'm not making fun of the French. I just, no, uh, yeah. if, I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I would also if, go for it. Yeah, if, if it a, <laughs> that's, that's the yeah that's that's the, the, the French special supplies. Uh, the Americans always seem to have like beef jerky and Dr Pepper as their special. <laughs> they they have the French. They're French or fresh seafood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, so the Central Asian states themselves um, involved themselves <laughs> with post Taliban uh, government and other leaders in Afghanistan, and they started state to state relations. And relations were far better with the Afghan central government than they had ever been before. Um, and we'll discuss some of those relationships later. I'm sorry, you're seeing my Tajikistan bias. All my photos are of President Rahman. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, at this time there was a sense that there were opportunities after 2001 between Central Asia and Afghanistan. Um, unfortunately, you had other uh, more negative aspects. Um, the drug trade um, hugely increased after 2001. Um, of course, the, the trafficking also goes through um, Iran and Turkey and the Balkans, uh, but the Central Asian route um, is quite heavily trafficked. That increased after 2001 um, in a very large way. Um, major economic projects were either restarted or proposed or reproposed, and this is the often discussed TAPI uh, gas pipeline from Turkmenistan to Pakistan and India, still only on a map, um, not on the ground. I'm going to discuss that later as well. Um, 
more realistic. Um, I kind of make fun of the pipeline, but electricity um, exports are reasonable. Um, the infrastructure is there. Um, it's an ongoing project. There's already electricity flowing. Um, just the hope is on some in Central Asia to expand production and sell more to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and then there's also a railway project. This is actually an existing railway. Um, this is uh, built by Uzbek Timur Yulara um, from Hayratwan um, towards mazar sharif However, there's another railway um, that hopefully has funding. It'll go from Turkmenistan through northern Afghanistan, connect to this railway to Uzbekistan, and then connect up to Tajikistan as well. And that would really help. Um, from Turkmenistan, you're connected to Iran, and that would make traffic from Iran go a lot quicker. But um, despite the relatively peaceful post-2001 years in northern Afghanistan, well, at least until, say, 2008, 2009, when serious fighting again returned to the north, uh, the neighboring states of Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan didn't seriously attempt to boost their economic relations. There were some large projects proposed like this. Um, but the increase in trade, sometimes they'll say, oh, it was a four times increase, it was an eight times increase. And it sounds hugely impressive, but the increase was from almost nothing to a, a small, modest number. Um, so the percentages of trade are just not important. I think the highest level is, well, for Tajikistan, imports are 10% from Afghanistan, but with Uzbekistan, it's a single digit import and export. Um, Turkmenistan, it's Iran and, and elsewhere that are far more important. So still very low level. Um, as for cultural and people to people ties, um, for example, I mean, I, I meet people at the universities, they're like, I have colleagues from Afghanistan that I've I've known since the 70s at the, the, the Academy of Sciences there. You know, we have great exchange, we know each other. However, it's some sort of very isolated uh, intellectual uh, connections. They're not too broad. Um, use this photo, and everyone talks about interactions with Afghanistan. And again, it's all about Russia. Interactions, Russia, Russia, Russia. I, I just love that sign. Sorry, that's the crazy Zhirinovsky party uh, sign, the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia. Um, and uh, there are the Central Asians there for, um, for Eid prayers. Uh, so Central Asians look to Russia for work. And even beyond that, there is a genuine, genuine appeal of Russia in Tajikistan among Tajiks. It's not just, oh, it's a place we go work. Every time I ask about the negative parts of life in Russia, like, yeah, it can be hard, but Tajikistan is boring. Russia is exciting. There's stuff to do. Stuff happens. I like Russia. It's something like, I have a girlfriend, you know? I can't have a girlfriend here. Um, so there, there are things where they will, you know, they, they will reject this idea of Russia just being a horrible place you go to work for in the snow for a while. Um, as for those Central Asians who embrace a stronger Muslim identity, they heavily look towards, say, uh, Arab countries. Um, I'm talking to young people who want to get a better religious education, and they, they feel that in Tajikistan it's, it's not a genuine, real uh, education. And, of course, for them, the Arab world is the place to be. And there's no, there's no idea of going to Afghanistan or to Pakistan for that. Pakistan a bit with Jamaat Tablit. Um, however, I don't hear that very much in Tajikistan. I think it's more popular in parts of Kyrgyzstan. Um, but again, even the religious um, Tajiks and Central Asians I meet, they don't really talk about Afghanistan as a, a place that particularly appeals to them. Um, so, question. Yep. Can we have the question at the end, maybe? Yes. Or just quick clarification. Is there any particular Arab country that attracts? I mean, first of all, like they, they, they say, like, well, I want to study, I want to study Islamic jurisprudence. And of course, they say Saudi Arabia first. But that's not that reasonable. They're actually, it's more reasonable to go to uh, Egypt, for example. Um, if you have no money, some would go to Yemen, but people are having the impression that that's kind of dangerous these days. Um, but even some to Turkey. I mean, there's, there's a number of places you can go, not just the Arab world. But again, they mention Arab countries first. They want to learn Arabic. 
Um, of course, the, that's the religious young guys. Um, so I want to move on back to the Afghan side. Um, the insurgents of North, this is, sorry, this is, uh, he's long gone, uh, former high-ranking guy in the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, Tahir Yildashev. Um, the insurgents of Afghanistan's North, it's extremely complex phenomenon that can't be simply described. My time in Afghanistan, the more you research and the more you ask, the more, real, the more you realize that you know nothing about, it's just so complex, so complicated, um, so many different relationships, groups, identities. It's really hard to say there's these defined groups. Um, I get into that. The, so the Taliban, and to a significantly lesser extent, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan would be the two major groups in the north. Um, few allegations of increased Islamic movement of Uzbekistan uh, operations in northern Afghanistan are really ever really confirmed by evidence from the field. By evidence, I mean, I would even take what's happening in Syria right now. That's evidence. I can see these are clearly Central Asians, clearly Uzbek speaking. They're there. I accept that. Afghanistan, it can't get shown the same thing. Uh, talking to the people who hand over the bodies of the insurgents, they're like, yeah, it's, it's locals. We're, locals are coming to get the bodies. And when we have the leftover bodies, we, we say that one's a Chechen, that one's an Arab, and that one's a Pakistani. And then... They do prayer for them and bury them, but it was like, well, that's uh, evidence. They just decided to call the leftover dead bodies uh, foreign insurgents. Um, so when people are arrested or targeted as IMU in northern Afghanistan by local security forces, uh, foreign security forces, special American special forces, um, they've always been... The Uzbeks have always been local Uzbeks, and, um, or sometimes just uninvolved uh, civilians or insurgents, and Uzbeks belonging to the Taliban, Uzbeks fighting in the Taliban. It's possible for non-Pashtuns to be members of the Taliban, and that's happening in the north. So sometimes people just like using the shorthand, oh, they must be IMU. Um, so, the IMU, I... I would sort of defer to Noah Tucker if anyone follows his research. Um, I guess I'll save or leave stuff to him. But I just don't see them as a strong group inside of Afghanistan at all. They're extremely marginalized. They are there, um, just not in very much force. It, could they regroup to cause any problems for Central Asia? I don't see that anytime in the near future. Um, and now it, it seems like IMU is sort of out of style. Um, it's uh, Syria is the place to be. Um, so I, I don't think there's any rush to sort of tribal areas of Pakistan. Uh, Syria is definitely getting recruits from Central Asia. Afghanistan, occasional, occasional person gets arrested down there from Central Asia, but very small numbers. Um, extremely small numbers when compared to Syria, whether you accept the highest numbers or even a more moderate number. Um, as for the foreign objectives of the Taliban, if they regain power, I mean, it's really too early to talk about, Taliban, about a Taliban strategy towards Central Asia. Um, they did release a public statement about a year ago. Not that you can take all their public statements at face value. I mean, I don't take American government statements at face value. I don't really take anyone's statement at face value. But they said in their statement that the, that the Islamic Emirate, Taliban, they do not want to pose any harms to other countries from their soil, nor will they allow anyone to cause a threat to the security countries from the soil of Afghanistan. They sort of let the IMU do that in the 1990s, but right now they're at least saying we have no interest in Central Asia. Um, and obviously their first priority is inside of Afghanistan, but if they did regain control, what would be their relationship with Afghanistan, uh, with the countries of Central Asia? I and mean, that's sort of an unknown. Um, Moving away, not about the government, not about the insurgents, uh, northern Afghan politicians and leaders and their relations with Central Asia. That's now Vice President Rashid Dostum, that's the governor of Gulf, uh, Atta Muhammad Nur, I, particularly powerful for a government, for a governor. And uh, they've had long-standing uh, business ties, and people around them have had long-standing business ties with Central Asia. Um, 
they uh, they either own the businesses themselves or they provide uh, facilitation and protection for these businesses which have uh, connections in Central Asia. Um, so it could just be something like uh, gas, petrol from Central Asia, uh, or construction material going the other way. And so there, there, there is regular trade to be had there, um, but it is dominated by um, some uh, prominent figures in the north. Um, other people whose names would be somewhat less known um, are also involved in the trade. And then there's some very small, like bizarre level trade going on as well. Um, so, the current situation. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of beating a dead donkey here, but if there was ever an American strategy of politically and economically disconnecting Central Asia from the Russian sphere of influence and orienting it south towards Afghanistan and South, south Asia, it's been a failure. Not that I think they really seriously tried. There's just mostly talk about that. The only really notable success here is the hope for continued to increase electricity exports um, and that had been sort of created in a regional framework. Um, and this new Silk Road strategy that they talk about, it's really only ever talk with uh, no money or action behind it. Um, that's the new Silk Road. The real Silk Road is, of course, China. Um, there's gas, uh, pipeline in red, oil in green. Um, and connections like this are just picking up speed. Um, this is current and planned future transport networks between China. And Afghanistan is a bit of a empty place here. But I don't see any realistic chance for serious transport infrastructure being built that would connect Central Asia to South Asia. Um, there's not the money, the will, or the economic need um, at this time. Um, of course, China is just increasing its influence in Central Asia economically. Um, there are always VIPs when they visit, VIPs of the highest order. Um, so Central Asia is increasingly becoming connected to China in terms of trade and energy exports, while at the same time uh, maintaining its strategic and economic connections to Russia, of course. Um, I love this picture. <laughs> Looks like Chaburashka in a business suit. Uh, but this is at the, this is at the uh, 201st uh, Russian base in Dushanbe. Uh, and the Russians uh, renewed the base through 2042. And they didn't have to give too much in return. Um, some military supplies and uh, a little bit of funding for the Tajik military. Um, so this is, this is near my house in Dushanbe. Um, this is... Uh, Russia is, Russia is there. Russia is going to be there. Russia is not going anywhere. Um, you know, over 50% of Tajikistan's GDP is from uh, remittances from outside the country. So they need Russia. It, does, it doesn't have anything to do with liking or disliking Russia. They need Russia. They can't do without Russia. Um, so it's sort of... I just made fun of the lack of infrastructure ties. This is a uh, bridge connecting southern Tajikistan to northern Afghanistan. It's somewhat uh, Kunduz would be um, a little further away from the other side, and the nearest Tajik city here would be um, Panj or uh, Kurgan But oh, uh, the story behind this bridge that I was telling Marlin is uh, this bridge was built basically because of Donald Rumsfeld. Um, he visited Tajikistan and Uzbekistan in uh, late 2001, and both the Uzbek and Tajik government were very helpful to him and said, if you need a base, you need support, you need flyover rights, you've got it. He ended up basing mostly in Uzbekistan, but he felt that, yeah, he's like, i got to give the, the Tajik government something for being so hospitable. And so he pressured, he pushed through some funding for a bridge. So there's no economic assessment for the bridge, there was no need assessment, it, no one was demanding a bridge here, um, it's, it was just built as a present, and it's a, it's a quiet, quiet place um, for a bridge of that size, you'd, you'd think they'd have more traffic, but it's, uh, it's pretty quiet. Um, so Afghanistan and in reverse Central Asia, they 
can't be expected to offer each other anything of serious economic significance. I'm not saying there's not economic connections, it's just they're at a very low level and there's not potential for them to increase. Um, the economic significance of Afghanistan, it can only be seriously felt in some of the smaller towns near the Afghan border. And in some locations, it actually skips over those towns. So maybe in southern Uzbekistan, right near the border, um, you can feel it there. But in Tajikistan, it, it kind of hops over and goes straight to Dushanbe and uh, Kurgan Jube. Um, the actual border area is just sort of really isolated, um, really not much happening there. Um, closer to the centers of power in Central Asia, there are some individuals with economic interests in Afghanistan. Um, however, these are quite small when you measure them against other far larger, more important uh, trade connections, say to China, to Russia, uh, even to Turkey. So there isn't, I would say, there's not a very strong, strong business lobby for Afghanistan in Central Asia. Um, Uzbekistan could end its trade with Afghanistan and not feel any pain whatsoever. Well, the government elites could not feel any pain whatsoever. Um, in Tajikistan, there would be some minor bumps here and there, but it wouldn't be a serious problem to isolate themselves economically. Um, Turkmenistan, though, um, they have hopes for some serious economic infrastructure that would tie it to Afghanistan, uh, especially that proposed pipeline. And there's been more talk and handshaking and agreements and promises made, but the skepticism remains. Uh, it's the de deteriorating security. There's not the clear funding. Um, unless some investor has $8 billion they've got right now that they want to spend on a pipeline that goes through Helmand, Kandahar, and Baluchistan. It's just not going to happen right now. I mean, it would be realistic if the region was completely at peace. Um, but at the moment, uh, I don't see it happening. Electricity exports, I'm uh, a little more positive on. Those should continue. There's uh, there is a sur well, sort of a surplus uh, during part of the season in Central Asia, and uh, that does get exported to Afghanistan and provides uh, a decent chunk of revenue. Um, narcotics trafficking is a little more positive. Um, we could put it that way. Um, the northern route uh, passes through Central Asia with. Tajikistan handling most of the traffic. Um, so the most likely continued connection between Afghanistan and Central Asia would be continued drug, drug trafficking. That has been able to resist every roadblock put in its <coughs> uh, uh Narcotics, as someone else said, I can't remember who I'm quoting, but they're a great example of inter-ethnic cooperation. As cross-border cooperation, inter-ethnic cooperation, uh, market economics on display, um, the drug traffic, moves across all boundaries. Uh, so well, the, the governments is sort of, you know, the governments of Central Asia, they sometimes claim that terrorists and extremist groups are behind the Central Asian narcotics trade. I, the people saying that don't believe it. The people reading that don't believe it. Nobody believes it. Um, everyone understands very well, um, say, in Tajikistan, for example, that police and security officials are heavily involved in trafficking. That's, there's really no doubt there. Um, Security, um, sorry, the narcotics photo. Um, being prepared for possible spillover from Afghanistan into Central Asia, that's brought up all the time. Um, yet the threat of Islamist insurgents connected to Afghanistan is exaggerated. Uh, regional governments claims usually have more to do with the desire to justify oppressive internal uh, policies and authoritarian tactics, while at the same time, such as Tajikistan, uh, seeking money, weapons, and support from a variety of foreigners, the Russians, the Americans, anyone else. So they, they like to sort of exaggerate this security threat um, and hope to get funding along those lines. And it sometimes does work. Um, but you know, the threat being exaggerated doesn't mean the threat does not exist at a lower level, um, nor does it mean that unseen future events in Central Asia couldn't create an environment more conducive for this sort of thing to happen. But at the moment, I don't see it. Not many people see it. Um, there are definite th threats felt by the government of Central Asia, but it's always internal threats of other elites and people within the government. Um, it's not Islamist insurgents, not their major threat. If you look at what the Committee for National Security in Tajikistan, who they go after, who they spend their time 
on its its other elites within the country, uh, opposition figures who have nothing to do with Islamist groups, um, and not too much time really seriously tracking down an Islamist threat because it doesn't exist. And I can talk about that a bit more later in detail afterwards. Um, so, Turkmenistan, this is their border. Um, their representation of a neutral state is um, it's not accurate. Um, Turkmenistan's role is more accurately described as a state that will deal with any group or country that can provide it with benefits, whether it's a powerful Afghan commander or politician, the Taliban, uh, Russia, Iran, the American military. The Turkmen government is very pragmatic and they can switch policies immediately and form new relationships <coughs> immediately. Um, so they're able to adapt if, if strategically, ideologically, um, to whatever potential security challenges come along. And they went from uh, talking with the Taliban regularly and having a Taliban office in their capital city and then Within two months, they were allowing the CIA to do rendition flights through that same city. Um, and for them, it was just a quick switch, no problem. Um, Uzbekistan, I mean, the country with a navy on their river. Uh, a little more capable in terms of their security forces, their military, their, their committee for national security are better trained, better paid, more capable in general. Um, this, actually, there's two cutters, boats of guns are called cutters, as Google tells me. Um, they got two of these, uh, paid for by the U.S., purchased from Ukraine, and the Swedish company put new armor on them, and now they're on the Amu Darya. Um, I don't know what they're doing, watching Turkmen herders with their sheep on the other side. Um, not too much action there. Um, Tajikistan. They're always mentioned as the most vulnerable to instability crossing over from Afghanistan. Um, long, unsecured border, a uh, higher level of interaction with Afghanistan compared to other countries, and uh, less competent security forces in Tajikistan sort of make this country more of a worry than you would have for Uzbekistan, who's sort of on autopilot. There's no big concerns about them and their relations uh, with Afghanistan. Um, but I, not going to exaggerate the importance of Tajikistan. I probably should if I wanted to, you know, get some consulting work or something. But I, I just can't say it's this hugely important geostrategic uh, piece at the moment. Um, old picture. I know Obama's got black hair, so, <laughs> so I guess that you. I don't know when he visited. It must have been five years ago. Old photo. Um, so basically. My argument, and the argument of many others, is that uh, security risks that link Afghanistan and Central Asia are exaggerated, um, especially so when we're talking about um, radical Islamist groups and insurgents. Um, that threat is internal to Afghanistan. It doesn't look like it's going to cross over anytime soon. Um, as far as insurgents within Afghanistan, overwhelmingly recruited inside Afghanistan and in Pakistan, um, from Central Asia, it's so small now, it's barely even worth considering. Um, the view from Afghanistan is still somewhat unclear at this moment. Like, Afghanistan has its own problems right now. And so what their interests in and strategies towards Central Asia are, um, it's unclear at the moment. Um, it's just clear that Central Asia is never going to have the importance in Afghanistan that Pakistan and Iran have and will continue to have. And they're huge economic markets for Afghanistan. Uh, there's a lot of relations between Pakistan and Iran and internal uh, um, local forces in Afghanistan. So the focus obviously should continue on Pakistan and Iran in terms of their foreign policy. Um, as for economic potential, uh, there's just too many barriers. Established infrastructure goes to Russia. Uh, the vast majority of newly built infrastructure heads to China. Uh, Afghanistan and Central Asia, they're just not really well suited to be trade partners with each other. Um, it's like two peripheral small markets connected elsewhere. Why should they integrate with each other? Um, so, but Europe, the United States, and Russia, they're going to continue in this region, um, particularly in supporting police and military forces. It's just not any great game 
It's, uh, it's a pretty small level. If you look at American military commitments and training levels elsewhere and compare them to what's going on in Central Asia, it's pretty clear that Central Asia is uh, pretty low on the list. Although it's not ignored. I mean, the Department of Defense regularly visits Uzbekistan, and I have no idea what they're talking about. They're talking about something. Um, but as someone in the military says, yeah, it's, it's about redundancy. It's about plan B. You always want a backup plan. You want to create as many relationships as possible. You may never use them, but it would be good to uh, uh, have some familiarity with the people on the ground there. And if we can do training, that's a good way of... Uh, keeping those relationships active. Um, so I'd never rule out that some small American base or presence might pop up in Central Asia in the future um, if they need that um, for needs related to Afghanistan. Um, but again, that would still be a, a while away. Um, oops. Sorry, Virginia National Guard. There's some really boring training programs. Virginia National Guard is there. Um, but then Special Operations Forces are also in Tajikistan um, doing a variety of training. Um, welcome to Afghanistan. Um, I don't know what I'm supposed to say for this, but um, someone took some paint to the sign to fix the Russian grammar, as they thought. Um, so this is, this is the border. Um, I was there with some friends, and this is where the bridge, the main bridge is just to the left. And, um, it was an, like a fuel depot, and the fuel lines crossed over the border. And we looked over, and it's right, uh, KGB border posts, some uh, um, viewing posts, barbed wire fences. But we just walk around and do whatever we wanted to look at stuff and photograph stuff. My friend had been there regularly. I was just like, well, I, I, I thought by some, by some point someone would drive up and say, who are you? What are you doing here? If this was Uzbekistan, that certainly would have happened. Um, and he just joked. He's like, they're, they're up the river trafficking heroin. They don't care about us. Um, there, so there are, there's, there's stuff happening down there. Um, not too much in the way of legitimate trade. It's pretty quiet. Um, and standing here, you just feel that Afghanistan and Central Asia are just completely disconnected. Um, so the report of that title um, probably answers a lot of this stuff more detailed way. Um, my co-author, he actually knows about Afghanistan. I'm somewhat of a tourist. Um, he did all the field work in northern Afghanistan. Um, but at this point, I should hand it over to Marlene. Okay, great. Thank you. It was a wonderful overview of all the different aspects. So we can now open the floor for questions. I have, maybe I can begin. I, I wanted you, I wanted to ask you about this, all these reports we have now coming from the Turkmen Afghan border. Yeah. Like a lot of tension, several border guards who have been uh, killed, and a lot of discussion about knowing if it's drug trafficking, which is probably yeah. the case. But also, there are several reports saying that there are more and more tensions between inside Turkmen in Afghanistan themselves yeah. with different villages and different groups. Some mm -hmm. um, going on the, the, the Taliban side, the other yeah. on the, the Kabul side, I mean, even if it means what it means for, for the region. So what would be your um, assessment on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, I was asking about these attacks on Turkmen border guards, and some were killed. And um, right away, the Taliban said, we didn't do that. That's not us. And certainly, Taliban leadership would have no interest in Taliban attacking Turkmen border guards. They've had good, rela good relations with the Turkmen government in the past, and there's no real need for them to attack border um, local commanders may have a reason to do it, but I know I doubt it. Like most people there say it's something to do with cross-border smuggling, not, e not necessarily drug smuggling, other smuggling. Um, and then within the local Turkmens, there are Tur ethnic Turkmen in the Taliban. There are ethnic Turkmen in the local police militias. There's, there's uh, prominent local commanders, politicians. Um, but the, some of the local researchers were asking questions, and they're like, you probably have to send someone there and spend a lot of time there. It's still unclear. But it doesn't look like anything that has a lot of momentum. Mm -hmm. that will continue. Attacks would continue on Turkmen border guards. But it did seem to really bother the Turkmen government, and they've now been digging ditches and putting up barbed wire fences in, in certain places. But yeah, that's, I mean, in Tajikistan, you have the incidents on the border. You know, there's a shootout, and the border guards kill some people. We don't really know what it's about. But whatever it is, always usually to do with smuggling and cross-border traffic, it never spreads 
further into the country. It doesn't turn into a larger fight. It's it's isolated border incidents that can be isolated now. So my guess is yeah, I'm not really worried about the Turkmen border. Please, questions? Yes. Um, I have several questions. I'll okay. try to confine myself to one at this okay. point. I uh, worked in uh, for USAID in Kabul for a year, so I'm familiar with mm -hmm. and also did some work in a couple of Central Asian countries for the IMF. Um, but, uh, and I must admit, I was rather skeptical of the planning documents I read that said, I was doing economic policy now, that said, uh, uh, pictured Afghanistan as the center, as the hub of all yeah. sorts of trade connections. Uh, and in fact, I uh, think I asked about this in your larger conference. Um, nonetheless, uh, people seem to be taking the Silk Road initiative seriously. Um, I'm talking about the money involved would be huge. Um, so you think, uh, anyway, yeah. would that <laughs> accomplish anything? Um, if the U.S. government would want to massively subsidize some transport infrastructure that would be not utilized very much, they could go ahead and build it. Um, but it just seems to continue to be talking, talking, talking. And while you're talking, a Chinese road building company just showed up and put down a new road, refurbished a railway, built a tunnel. Uh, the tunnels in Tajikistan, the Chinese are building are great. I mean, I turned pro-Chinese in Tajikistan. <laughs> My trips to the south are much shorter. They built an electricity uh, plant in Dushanbe, and last winter I had electricity the entire winter. Um, but yeah, it, it, if if the United States government wanted to throw down the money, the stuff would get built. Sure. I mean, well, you could delay long enough. The Chinese will. The, do yeah, it. Um, but the Chinese will do stuff in their interests. Um, so they're of course not interested in connecting Afghanistan and Central Asia. Um, that's not a big priority for them. Um, they'll take Turkmen gas, uh, real transport infrastructure to Kyrgyzstan and uh, uh, Kazakhstan. But yeah, it's a. Uh, Silk Road, Silk Road, Silk Road. Uh, even historically, I, the Silk Road didn't do quite the north-south thing that they imagined. It was more east-west. And Afghanistan was, throughout most parts of history, sort of like three different parts going three different directions. One towards uh, India, one towards Persia, and one towards uh, Central Asia. And uh, the trade, there was trade. I mean, we know there's trade in India and Central Asia a long time ago, but a pretty small level. So historically, I'd say no, there was no huge Silk Road. And I, could, I mean, I'm not an economist, but I figure if there was opportunity here, these things would have been built when there was peace, well, relative peace in Afghanistan. We had years where the insurgency was tiny, nothing compared to now. Northern Afghanistan was just fine, you'd go anywhere. So that would have been the time uh, if it was economically rational to go ahead and do it. but. If I may add on that, I think the U.S. has always been relatively clear that they will clear that they will never commit money. It was the idea that the international financial organization will commit money, and mostly Asian Development Bank or World Bank, so they were always very clear that it would not be a U.S. project. It would be kind of a U.S. narrative mm -hmm. on an international community yeah. or in international institution yeah. uh, project. But as Christian said, there was never any kind of study of the commercial viability, and especially on the involvement of the private sector. If you ask the private sector, do they want to have truck crossing all these countries while they could send just a huge uh, 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 ship across sea, then no, everybody will tell you in the private sector that they don't care about continental uh, trade or only for some very specific yeah. sectors. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we, we know Uzbekistan used to support Afghanistan just a mm -hmm. long time before, like, because he's of the ethnic Uzbek, yes. you know, and now he is the vice president of Afghanistan. Yes. So can we expect some increased or improved relations between Kabul and Tashkent? And what could be yeah. the areas that we um, see such relations? Well, it's still unclear what the Office of Vice President of <laughs> Afghanistan actually does. It's kind of ill-defined. Um, and then he's not the number two, as we predicted. It seems now in the deal, 
that <laughs> the, yeah, he's the, the, the CEO, Dr. Abdullah is uh, the number two. Um, yeah, I, I'd see it more from the Uzbekistan side. Um, if they want an increase in relationships, they can increase them. Um, on the Uzbek side, sure, uh, gas and electricity exports. Um, you know, not, there's a shortage at time in Uzbekistan of those commodities, but they'll sell them anyways. Um, but honestly, I don't see having an Uzbek vice president as being able to overcome the obstacles to stronger connections with Central Asia. Uh, but yeah, he does have connections in Tashkent. Um, uh, and now those connections will be more valuable. But I, I don't think he can do anything that Hamid Karzai couldn't do. It's not like Uzbekistan was refusing to you know, work with Karzai or there was some block there. Um, so yeah, I, I think things would continue on as, as, as they have. Yeah. Uh, years ago when I, when I visited Bazaar, everyone was then very optimistic about the railway expansion, yeah. especially the foreigners. Yeah. Uh, having been back to Mazar recently, what failed to happen or didn't happen or uh, why was it not as wonderful as everyone had hoped? Um, I was asked this question in Kabul and I was saying, I asked, I asked how, when that train actually travels, how full is it? And they didn't quite know, but what I've been hearing is it's not this huge active booming railway. Um, the actual levels that it's operating at, I, I don't know. My research partner was here. He probably had tea with the train conductor, um, and he can tell you. But no, it just uh, it, it's 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 nice little toy up there, but it's not a huge, amazing um, boom economically. Even though it's the only link, right? I mean, the only link to the north. Lot, I mean, it is yeah, I mean, interesting the, that they don't use it really. Um, the, I mean, the a lot of stuff. It comes on trucks from, say, Pakistan or Herat or from Pakistan, and for those trucks to then go to a depot and then transfer everything to a train, when that truck could just continue on to Hyratan and then unload there. Again, I'm not in the railway business, but it just... It, um. Yeah, I think it's a very different sector. So things that you usually tr that you put on a, on a railroad are very specific. That's not the thing that are the usual yeah. trade that Afghanistan yeah. and its neighbor are doing by... by by trucks, yeah. so and I think it's mostly used by the to exit. I mean the the, the U.S. and the NATO material is which is right away. part of the northern distribution. Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, which now is like almost down to nothing. Like the, the traffic is very very very. Uh, the white, the ah, yeah. Uh, you probably know the big Tajik analyst Muzaffar Alimov. Yes. You even may probably met him. So at one point, uh, he uh, made an interesting comment about building these bridges between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. Bet before 20 2001, there were two bridges. Yes. Now it's six. Uh, I don't have information about how uh, big they are, and I think that the, most of them are like enough to have people moving around. Yeah. So his comment was that uh, he believes that by Building those bridges, the Western coalition actually exacerbated the situation with the drug trafficking, because with, with two bridges, it's not, mm -hmm. it's much more easy to control them, to yeah. put posts and stuff. But with six bridges, it kind of uh, got out of the way, and now the not only the the drug pro production had increased, but also drug trafficking is increasing as well. So what do you think about that point that actually Tajik believe that maybe he should have actually built those bridges, maybe it's actually bringing more trouble to Central Asia yeah. than in, any good? Honestly, you will meet people in Tajikistan and they'll just be like, we shouldn't have bridges to Tajikistan or to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. it's a dangerous place. Um, all right, I, I feel like uh, drug traffickers are like amazingly resourceful people <laughs> and they can learn how to fly, uh, burrow underground, swim, whatever. Um, so I, I think with or without the bridges, they could manage it. Mm -hmm. They would just lose a few people drowning or, you know, have to work a little harder. But yeah, with or without the bridges, I, I don't think it would be too much of a prob problem for the, the trade to continue. Um, the bridges themselves, I mean, the ones in Balakshan, um, have been helpful in very small local places. 
Um, it's still pretty modest. I mean, the little markets nearby are like uh, Chinese consumer goods going into Afghanistan, and uh, you know maybe some Pakistani fruits that you can't get in the uh, growing season in Central Asia. Um, not huge thriving um, markets, but in those bridges, what was the Agahan Development Network built? That was mm -hmm. not really well. The government sometimes claims they built them, but yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> built by the, the, the goodwill of the Agahan. Mm -hmm. um, Um, both IMU and the Islamic Jihad Union yes. still do have an impressive online presence. Mm -hmm. um, and in the parts of Afghanistan that you have research, is, is internet, social media are, popu are, they, are they popular? How much do you think they use that? Facebook is huge in Afghanistan, absolutely huge. Um, everyone's on Facebook, um, and on the insurgent side, and people that speak for them or that uh, think they speak for them are very active on on Facebook. Uh, and um, yeah, and they're not roaming around with like uh, really high speed internet and smartphones, but they're not too far off from that. Um, so, but it's yeah, it's it's not quite Syria, but. Um, Right, people are, are you getting at, like, maybe they're there, but they're not uploading right. it yet? Right, well, I mean, um, we, we, we've long thought that they are actually operated out of Turkey. Because they used to, the content used to be in Russian, oh, yeah, Uzbek, yeah. and Turkish yeah. for a while. Yeah. And what was even more impressive was the quality of the language. Mm -hmm. They used to write in Cyrillic yeah. and in good Uzbek. It's not like, you know... They're, they're definitely not creating that content out of some caves, you know, yeah. in Afghanistan. Well, in, in Afghanistan, um, well, at least come outside your cave for a mobile phone reception. <laughs> and uh, Good video laptop. quality, HD, you know. Yeah, you could, uh, in lot, many parts of Afghanistan, including in areas that are Taliban controlled, there's uh, cell phone towers, you can get a, you can get a signal. Um, but yeah, no, I... I I always assume that was either from Russia, Turkey, or Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, if I could follow up with another sure. question, yeah, very quickly. Yeah. Um, you were saying that you know Pentagon is constantly talking to to the governments, right, in Central Asia. Yeah. We know that they constantly talk about border security, mm -hmm. fighting the uh, drug trafficking. Yeah. They talk about little amounts of you know military um, assistance. Um, so on the ground, you see no difference, no, no, no impact from those, from, from that kind of cooperation. They're they're very, very, very small. I mean, if like I said, you compare it to American security cooperation mm -hmm. elsewhere and funding. So it's kind of obvious. I mean, you're driving to the south, and your taxi drivers are like, "Look, American Spetsnaz," you know. It's, <laughs> it's the military base is right next to the road, but it's it's not this huge, obvious presence. Um, Training programs, or like I mean, when you were on the border, you didn't see that they had better. Oh, I on guess. the border, mm -hmm. uh, on the border, because um, they have provided millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, worth of border and security. then they don't want anyone to come check up on it. Um, <laughs> oh, well, what the government claims for in in, in terms of numbers along the border, a, a German guy traveled the length of the border and counted um, border cards. <laughs> it's like fifteen percent of the claim of the government. Um, but, I mean, there's just, like, the one by the bridge, is, it looks like a modern border crossing. There are obviously facilities there. Um, the OSCE, their border management staff college, it's kind of taking over the OSCE compound. It's, it's got plenty of funding. Um, but it's, it's not like this obvious huge foreign presence. Um, I don't know how much, say, the Tajik government actually needs it. Um, I mean, the Uzbek government, they, they're self-sufficient for what Tajikistan actually needs for their forces, I'm not sure. I st still, the Russian connection would be far more important militarily. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was that um, the best example of cross-border uh, cooperation is uh -huh. the narco trade. Um, and um, you know, having spent time in Tajikistan, we, we know that that's very institutional and it's on the Tajik side. Yeah. Um, as far as the, the upstream, Af upstream Afghan side, do you see um, the power structures behind um, the narco Production and trafficking on the Afghan side leading to uh, dynamics that put <clears throat> certain groups in more powerful positions in the future. Um, how do you see that changing the security um, um, in Afghanistan? In, terms in, of specific in Afghanistan, there's a lot of powerful, rich people. Um, and yeah, you, you do 
you do need to make a lot of money to buy the political capital to protect yourself. Um, a lot of that money just moves straight out of the country and buy a place in Dubai or elsewhere. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to be monopolized by anybody. It doesn't seem to be serious, hardcore competition inside Afghanistan. Um, it, it seems to be there's some sort of equilibrium reached. But again, finding the exact character of this, hard to say. Um, in, in, in every area, it can be different who's, who's sort of dominant in that area. And then there's always rumors floating around like this, this guy is up to his neck in drug trafficking. This guy does that. Um, yeah, but drugs is going to be hugely important, but rich people in Afghanistan have not necessarily been able to project political power. There's been a couple of businessmen in the Afghan North who are extremely powerful. They had a lot of money, and they would say lend money to someone like Dostum when Dostum needed money, but they, they couldn't project the force that Dostum could, and Dostum couldn't bring the financial resources they could. Um, so they can sort of buy influence occasionally, but they don't seem to be like becoming a militarized narco network like you'd see in parts of Latin America. Well, I thought the Taliban were largely um, uh, funded through drug trade. Not in the beginning when they were against it. But, uh, um, they, they tax it. They tax everything. 10% uh, there, 10%. I think they can charge higher on the heroin. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, I mean, uh, people connected to the Afghan government are far more involved than Taliban would be, but that's one of their sources of revenue, but there's many sources of revenue, including uh, transportation contracts for the U.S. military. The, the guys driving the trucks, um, uh, the contractors, they pay the Taliban not to attack them so they can supply the American bases. And uh, this, I mean, Department of Defense said so openly. Um, well, at least one of their officers did. Um, but yeah, there's a huge range of uh, funding options for the Taliban and taxing Drug trafficking is one of them. Um, I told me, nice. Yeah, I know a tax collector for the Taliban. He goes around with a, a bag, a sack, mm -hmm. and he goes around to the growers and the traffickers, and they, they put in their percentage. And he, this is a guy who walks around Helmand with a giant bag full of American dollars and just taxes. Yes, yeah, so no, the Taliban aren't like centralized control, but they're taxing it. Has there been any discussion at high levels about inviting, quote unquote, Russian border guards back to the border? Well, I'm, especially in Tajikistan, but maybe in Uzbekistan. I'm not invited to the high level meetings, <laughs> but um, it's, like, it's like it seems like it's some random Russian journalist or commentator saying that. Um, but I, I don't think. Russia is like, oh God, we need to be back on the border. I think Russia's got other things to worry about right now. Um, would they want the responsibility of taking over the border again? Um, they, they, I mean, they've got the bases inside Tajikistan. Do they want the border? I don't think they have a strong desire. And then on the Tajik side, of course, that's now a piece of their sovereignty, and they probably wouldn't want to hand it, uh, hand it back to the Russians. No. Uh, so the Russians don't really want it. The Tajiks don't want to hand it back. I, I think it's continuing as a as a as a Tajik Afghan border. If I can add on that, I think it's also it's just a tool of negotiation also between Moscow and Dushanbe. So when they have some tension, because yeah. Rahman is not always a good friend of Mr. Putin, yeah. so then they just reactivate the topic. And in fact, the the CSTO has been saying officially that they want it to be back. But that's also, yeah, that's part of the declaration, just to be sure that Tajikistan will remain part of the, the Russian sphere of influence and so on. I think mostly they consider they have advisors, military advisors, and they should consider um, that's already enough. Yeah, there, there, there are Russian advisors in a lot of places that Russian advisors are not officially. Um, so Russians pop up here and there. And so I, I think they, they have the relationship. They can monitor what they want. They, they, they just go around. So... It'd be too much work to really get all the border guards back on the border, even though most of the border guards were actually local, locally recruited. Oh. <coughs> uh, I'm McDermott, <coughs> Jamestown Foundation. Um, I've been looking over a number of years at uh, <coughs> the security forces, both in Central Asia and in Russia, also trying to understand and analyze the issue of threat assessment and 
how threat assessment the extent to which the capacity of that threat assessment is actually very much tied to intelligence cooperation with Russian intelligence.